Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm glad to be able to uh, present to you guys our webinar on incorporating simulations in science courses, featuring our partner Simulation Curriculum, um, which is who are the creators of Starry Night. Um, this is a part of our larger webinar series on online teaching tips and resources. Um, so this is the, the third in our series. We have a couple more coming for you in the next couple of weeks. Um, but I, my name is Courtney Raymond, and I'm the marketing manager at OpenStax. And I'm here with Pedro Braganza from Simu uh, Simulation Curriculum. Hello, everyone. And we're just going to start out with a little bit of information about OpenStax. Um, if you've been on other of these webinars, you'll rehear some similar information, but I've tried to mix it up a little bit. So you don't have to listen to that same spiel. I'm trying to give you a little, uh, a little different flavor of OpenStax with each of these webinars. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in. All right, um, this uh, hasn't changed too much because OpenStax is still the same, uh, going after the same mission that we have been all along, um, which is to increase access to learning resources and to um, actually improve learning for students. So we are a publisher of open educational resources. We are a part of Rice University, which is based in Houston, Texas, um, and is a nonprofit. And we, um, we were formed in 1999 under a different name called Connections um, as a platform for people to be able to publish their own material and share it under open licenses. Um, but we evolved into OpenStax in our current format in 2012 when we published our first open resource, which was our college physics textbook. Um, so what we do now, our bread and butter is publishing those free, um, free openly licensed textbooks for the most highly enrolled introductory college courses. And these books do go through that same peer review process as a traditional textbook, but as a nonprofit, we're able to offer those under an open license, which means that they're available, uh, freely available online at all times, and um, the student never loses access and they have access from the very first day. Um, looking to the next slide, uh, I wanted to update you guys on this recent milestone that we crossed. So we have, um, as of this semester, saved students about $1.2 billion on textbook costs. Um, so we have served 14 million students so far, and this is um, from our reported numbers. We don't require instructors to report usage, um, but we do encourage it because it helps us to see our impact, and that helps us to tell our funders uh, the the impact of their philanthropy. So, um, so we, we just crossed, the, crossed this really big threshold this year and we're really excited about it. Um, we're wanting to continue to expand and reach more students at more schools. Right now we're in 60% of all degree granting institutions in the US, but also in countries around the world. Um, and we're, we're in about, uh, the classrooms of about 36,000 instructors this year. Um, as you can see, we, we have 42 textbooks at this point. Most of those are higher ed, but we are expanding our K-12 offering. So I think we have um, six K-12, five or six K-12 books at this point too, and that's going to be growing as well. Um, so a bit about our books. As I mentioned, we do our priority with our first um, 30 books was to cover the highest enrolled undergraduate college courses um, to have the greatest impact in the shortest amount of time. And then since then, we've expanded beyond that. Um, and in the future, we want to continue to go into verticals so that we could potentially um, offer content for an entire degree path. Our offerings into high school and even going down into um, middle school and elementary eventually. Uh, we do offer each book in multiple formats, including the online version for free. Um, it's in PDF or in browser, which is our recommended because it's responsive and allows you to highlight and take notes. But we also do offer low, ca low cost print versions, um, as well as uh, versions in Kindle and iBooks. Um, we, uh, the, the books do follow the standard scope and sequence of introductory courses so that they can be widely adopted by all different formats of um, courses. And the open license means that not only can we offer them for free, but that instructors can remix, reuse, revise, and redistribute them however they need to for the needs of their course. So you can take out pieces, you can mix in your own content or the content from 
other publishers, as long as you have the license for that content from the other publisher, um, you can do whatever you need uh, to, to make the book work for you. Um, I wanted to take you into our website for a moment. Um, I'm gonna take this over here and to just show you briefly um, an overview of the subjects we have to offer. I won't go in depth, but just so you can get uh, an idea of the types of books that we offer, we go through, we have math, science, social sciences, a couple of humanities, um, our newer business series, um, and here's our high school books as well. Um, I wanted to also show you each of our books um, comes with some free ancillary resources for instructors as well as for students. But those instructor ancillaries, to get access to those, you just need an instructor account, and those are free. Um, we just have to verify that you um, are, in fact, an instructor. This is how we make sure that the items stay out of student hands because we don't want them to see test banks and solutions manuals. Those are, those are for you to help, um, help your students. So to, to access any of those, you would just go to one of those book pages like I did, click on instructor resources. Um, all of those free ancillaries are, are here and um, you can download them. I'm already logged into my instructor account, so I would be able to just go ahead and download any of these. Um, and then you would be able to see our um, technology partners offered here at the right. And I'll go into that a bit more as well in a moment. Um, I also wanted to point out, so I know that this has been a really challenging time and continues to be um, a time of a lot of change and transition in the way that your course may be offered. So I wanted to point out that we also have created some additional resources that we hope will be helpful and based on feedback that we've gotten from instructors that would be helpful no matter whether you're teaching your course um, in person, online, in hybrid format. So you'll see on each book page we have um, a featured resource box that we continue to add to month by month. So we've developed some cartridges to help you more easily integrate the content into your LMS. Um, but we also have curated for uh, each subject, our editorial director has curated community resources for you. So these are free resources that you can use. Um, you can find these by going to our blog. So I just went to, went ahead up here, clicked on our blog. Um, so just find your, your subject area, you can click on it, and we have links to, to free resources that we've found useful for each of these um, subject areas. So um, as with this webinar series, we're just, we've, our focus this past year since March has really been to do what we can to try to help you and provide support in whatever, whatever you need in this unusual, unpredictable time. Um, in, in higher ed and in the world, really. Um, so um, the last thing I wanted to show you was a little bit about our partners, um, one of which is Simulation Curriculum, who's here with me today. So each book has those free resources like test banks, um, solution manuals, PowerPoint slides, um, but we also partner with other organizations who offer educational products, um, around our content for those instructors who do want something beyond the text itself and those ancillaries. And so uh, if I go here to technology and OpenStax Tech Scout, we have this tool that enables you to see all of our partner options um, and to filter based on uh, what book they support, but also the capability of the product. So you can select what type you're looking for, you can um, select other filters based on what you know you need for your course, and we'll show you which partners uh, offer, those, um, offer those features. And all of, this, uh, all of these filters are based on something called the Quick Framework, which was developed um, with funding from the Gates Foundation independently. We are using it under an open license, which we made it available under, and it was actually created to help in courseware decisions. Um, we simplified it a bit to direct it mainly at instructors who are making those considerations, and to simplify and to change the language so that it's more in the language that you may use as an instructor rather than the broader language that, that applies to an IT department or an administrator or whoever may involve, be involved in a decision like that. Um, and that's where you can get more information on all of the capabilities of each of our partners. And so if I go uh, clear and clear all of my selections, 
and go down to simulation or to Starry Night rather. Um, simulation curriculum is here. Um, they actually have even uploaded some images so you can get a feel for what it's like within the platform. Um, Pedro will be showing you more about that, but if you want to go back and reference or point it out to a colleague, those images are here. Um, you can visit the partner's website directly within, and then you can also sign up for a follow-up uh, if you want to hear back from our partner here. And uh, just to give you an idea of what this par these partnerships mean for us, we are partners with these companies. We call them OpenStax allies, and that's because they um, are allied with us in this mission to provide um, high quality options for instructors and students um, at a reasonable price. And so our allies really enrich our material and provide additional support to keep our books current. They, uh, they provide mission support fees based on the usage of, their pro of our content and their product. Um, and with those fees, we are able to fund our revisions when pedagogically necessary. And um, when we're not doing a full revision, we do make updates based on errata suggestions that our subject matter experts review and accept throughout the year. Um, and the, the support fees that they provide for us are what help to keep us, help us to keep that material fresh so that your students can go and access the most up-to-date content at all times. Um, so that's really an essential part of our ecosystem. Um, and that's, uh, so that's why I'm pleased to be sharing the stage with Pedro today. Um, we want, he's going to be telling you more about Starry Night, their product, but also giving some really good tips on just in general, what are some good ways to incorporate simulations in your course, um, especially now if you are doing um, more digital uh, offerings for your course to help enrich your students' understanding um, and provide some more interactivity. Um, in those courses. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton over to Pedro. Thanks, Courtney. Mm -hmm. All right, I think you should have the sharing invitation now. Okay. Oh, and Pedro, while you do, while you get your screen set up, let me add one more thing for the audience that I meant to mention earlier. You, you guys are all entered on mute um, so that we can keep background noise to a minimum, but we do wanna hear from you. So you may notice there's a questions panel. Um, some of you have already entered questions. Uh, please do enter your questions throughout the webinar here. We're gonna reserve time at the end to go through a Q&A. Um, and we wanna be able to address anything that might come up from, for you. So I'll be monitoring this section throughout the webinar and we will, um, whatever we don't, address during Pedro's presentation, we're going to address out loud at the end. So please let us know what you're thinking, let us know what your questions are, um, and we look forward to talking with you more about those. Excellent. So let me know if you can see my screen. I see it. We're good. So hi everyone, my name is uh, Pedro and I lead the development of simulation-based curriculum for the K-12 and college markets at a company called Simulation Curriculum. And we've been doing best-in-class simulation software for Earth and Space Science for the past 20 years. And today I'm really excited to share with you some of our best practices and ideas on how you can integrate computer simulations into your science instruction. And I'd like to acknowledge that the current events of the last few months have been unprecedented and have had a significant impact on the way we live, the way we learn, and the way we teach. Back to school this year looks and feels very different from past years. Many schools are now transitioning to hybrid or remote environments to ensure the safety of their staff and students. And technology, perhaps now more than ever, is playing an important and central role to ensure learning can continue now and into the future. Computer simulations in particular can serve an important part to engage students and enrich their understanding, no matter what your teaching environment is this year. So we're going to start by covering what simulations are, why they are effective, and how they can complement your instruction. We'll then go over five key steps or tips on how to select and incorporate simulations into your course. Afterwards, I will do a short demonstration of how we applied some of these ideas into one of our products called Starry Night College Textbook. Starry Night is a web-based learning platform that integrates simulations and assessments with the OpenStax astronomy textbook. At the end, we'll open up the floor to some Q&A. Okay. Let's see if I can change my slide. 
All right. So what are simulations? So generally, computer simulations offer digital models of real objects and natural phenomenon. They are designed to replicate and predict the behavior of and the outcome of a real world or physical system. There are many different types of simulations, from simulations that just pass along information with no user interaction, for example, a simple animation of earthquake waves, to experiential simulations where students are active participants and their choices determine the outcomes. Think of Gregory Mendel's plant experiments. Interactive and well-structured simulations can help students, can help guide students rather, in developing, understanding, applying, and extending basic concepts that might otherwise be time-consuming, too abstract or complex, expensive to run, or not possible to experience in any practical way. An astronomy simulation, for example, can help students appreciate the size and scale of the solar system or the motion of the planets. A laboratory simulation can prepare students for the actual experiment. Or a simulated frog model can provide all the excitement of a real dissection without the mess. However, we have to keep in mind that simulations are simplified models and by design omit details or interactions found in the real world. The advantage is that the simpler models allow students to gain a better understanding of cause and effect in a system. So here are some reasons why you might want to use simulations in your course. So for more than 20 years, research into science simulations across a broad range of subjects has shown that they have a positive impact on learning. Specifically, research shows that well-designed simulations are effective at boosting content knowledge, science process skills, things such as observation, measurement, inference, and so on, and also on bringing about conceptual change. In one such study, looking at moon phases using our program, Starry Night, the results were dramatic. As measured by a pretest, none of the participants had a scientific understanding of the cause of moon phases. After the use of simulations, most participants, 80%, were able to provide scientifically based explanations for the cause of moon phases. Notably, participants using Starry Night exclusively made substantially greater gains than those who made direct observations from nature alone, basically going outside and looking at the moon in the sky. This shows that simulations can actually provide better outcomes than traditional instruction in some cases. Now, being digital representations, simulations are ideally suited if you are delivering your course remotely. Many simulations are web ready and can be accessed with a modern web browser 24 seven ensuring students can view the content from anywhere at any time from any device. Simulations that require a specific operating system or hardware are not as flexible and might provide barriers for some students. And more on this point a bit later. Now, simulations cannot replace the science classroom and laboratory activities completely, especially when developing practical laboratory skills is the learning objective. But in a remote learning situation, simulations might be your only alternative. Look for interactive simulations that provide learner-centered experiences and allow students to explore on their own, manipulate variables, gain new perspectives, and even test hypotheses. Be aware of the limitations of simulations, but also embrace the advantages they offer over traditional instruction. For example, the ability to manipulate a 3D DNA molecule or change variables such as friction and gravity in an experiment. Things that might not otherwise be possible, but still provide enriching activities for students. Now, simulations across a broad range of topics from the simple to the complex are readily available, both for free and for a fee. They are very cost effective compared to expensive lab equipment and supplies, especially when compared to sending individual lab kits out to students in a remote learning situation. If you are using one of the many fantastic OpenStax textbooks, simulations are a great, great way to enhance the textbook experience for students by making the content more engaging and interactive. In my demo later on, I will show an example of how we enhanced OpenStax astronomy. Now, we've all seen some amazing computer um, simulations, and you might have incorporated some of them into your course or might have thought about it. 
and many instructors use this approach to slowly integrate a number of different simulations into their instruction over time. And this process can work for some. Come across something you like, figure out a way to use it, and make it a part of your toolbox to support student learning. But I do have some tips that will make the process of incorporating simulations based on a more systematic approach to learning, where all parts of your science instruction are harmoniously integrated into the whole. That includes learning outcomes, other teaching materials, delivery, and assessments. So you can see the five steps or tips here, but let's dig in a little bit closer. Okay, so step one. The first question you should ask is, can the course I am teaching benefit from computer simulations? And you might have very specific needs you are trying to meet, such as the ability to provide a virtual alternative to a traditional in-person lab. The key idea here is to clearly identify areas in your science instruction that might benefit from computer simulation. So what do I mean? Look for cases where, for example, simulations can help you continue to deliver your course in a hybrid or remote learning situation. For example, if you need to replace a laboratory component or classroom demonstration. You might even find yourself switching between remote, hybrid, and in-person due to the current pandemic situation. Simulations can aid in these transitions by providing a more seamless experience that allows you to continue to deliver your program, programming with the least amount of interruption. Now, you might also be looking at simulations to allow students to explore concepts that are not otherwise possible or complicated due to factors including frame of reference and location, time required to collect data, safety, cost, or just the ability to answer what-if questions. For example, perhaps you want to experiment with dangerous chemicals without putting students in danger. Now, you could also be looking to fully engage students in the learning process with visually compelling experiences to help them understand the nuances of a concept. At the same time, simulations can improve learning outcomes by boosting content knowledge and science process skills. You might also want to address students' misconceptions about science concepts, and this is a big one. It can be a challenge to help students change their conceptual framework, basically how new ideas take root. By having students make, take measurements, make observations, work with real data and test hypotheses, simulations can help students confront their beliefs and dispel their own misconceptions. Finally, you might also want to provide student-centered learning opportunities where students can develop independent learning skills and become an active participant in their learning. Now, there may be many other specific needs you are trying to address with simulations. The takeaway is that when identifying if there are opportunities to integrate simulations into your science instruction, consider how the use of simulations can add value to your course when compared to other methods of instruction. Okay, okay so how do you identify and select simulations for your course? This is step two. It's important to ensure the simulations you're adding align with your instructional strategies, desired learning outcomes, and assessment. When all of these components support each other, students have the best opportunity to learn. You might find a great simulation that is well-designed and engaging, but it might only fit loosely with one of your learning outcomes and not align with your existing assessment to help reveal whether a student has achieved the desired knowledge or skills. My tip is to align simulations to specific learning outcomes or objectives, especially those that can't be addressed otherwise. These are the knowledge or skills you want students to acquire by the end of a particular lecture, course, or program. So how do you do this? Start by carefully reviewing your learning outcomes and use them as a guide for identifying and selecting appropriate simulations. For example, if you are using one of the many excellent OpenStax textbooks, a good place to start would be to look at the learning objectives that are listed at the start of each chapter. So reading the learning objectives listed for this particular chapter section, you might want to identify and incorporate a simulation that shows the geometry of the Earth and Sun and allows the student to manipulate time over the course of a year to observe how the tilt of the Earth's axis causes the seasons. And simulations are ideal for this type of approach because most are self-contained and often address a specific concept or activity. 
This allows them to be used to target specific areas of your curriculum and work in conjunction with your other teaching materials. Now, an important note, if you do want to use a simulation that you really like, that is not a good match with your teaching objectives, you may still use it, but you may have to adjust your learning outcomes and assessment. So keep that in mind. Now, after you have selected a simulation and identified where it will be used in a lecture or course, you will need to consider how that simulation fits within the larger framework of instruction. And this is my step three. So the next set of tips are a few things to consider when integrating simulations into the structure of your course. Now, you probably already use a variety of teaching approaches from reading material, slides, videos, audio recordings, to hands-on activities and labs. Consider simulations as an additional tool that you can use in conjunction with your current instructional materials. The easiest way to do this is to use simulations as a supplement, not a full replacement. In the case of in-person labs that now need to be delivered online, you may not have an option but to use simulations as alternatives. Remember that no simulation can fully replace a real hands-on lab. So look for simulations that can prepare students for when they return to the lab to conduct the real experiment. My recommendation is to select simulations that address the core concepts of your lab and allow for collecting of data, manipulation of variables, and formulation of hypotheses. Now, I also recommend that simulations be learner-centered so that students are actively involved in formulating hypotheses, drawing conclusions, building inquiry-based skills, exposing misconceptions, and improving their self-confidence. Make sure that proper instructions are provided to students if a simulation is more complex so that students know how to use it. If you choose to incorporate simulations for during lectures or video demonstrations, ensure that students are engaged with the simulation and an active part of the learning process through questioning, analyzing, and reaching conclusions. Now, my last tip here is to make it clear to students that the simulation you assigned is a required component of a course. If you simply recommend a simulation as an enrichment activity, you might find that many students will not use the simulation or benefit from it. So attaching a quiz or assessment to a simulation is usually a good motivator. And I'll speak uh, more about assessment in a bit. All right, so how students access and use simulations is an important factor to consider so that the technology itself doesn't get in the way of your learning objectives. And this is step four. So here are some things to keep in mind. So computer simulations should be user-friendly and not require much time for students to become familiar with them. If a simulation requires significant time to learn how to operate, consider spending some time to demonstrate its functions to students beforehand. Take some time to think about how you plan on delivering the simulations to students and how they will be accessed and consumed. What devices are your students using to view the simulations? Is it phones, tablets, Chromebooks? Are the simulations web ready and platform independent or, they, or do they require specific hardware and operating systems to run? So compared to traditional desktop-only simulations, web-based simulations are cross-platform and offer the greatest flexibility in terms of supported devices, operating systems, ease of installation, access, and integration with learning systems. All you need is a modern web browser and an internet connection. For remote learning environments, it is almost a requirement. Now, to ensure the smoothest experience with a fewer number of issues, we always recommend using Google Chrome since most web applications are optimized for this web browser. Chrome currently accounts for about 65% of the global browser market. Next, select simulation products that can integrate seamlessly with your school's learning management system. This allows you to organize all of your remote learning content in one location and track learner progress and performance. When I speak with college instructors, this is one of the most important requirements. Now, there are simulations available for a broad range of topics. If you are putting your own set of simulations together, it is important to consider if the simulations will work with your current materials and workflow 
so you can deliver a consistent user experience to your students. It can be challenging to deliver several different simulations that all behave differently and have different requirements or modes of integration. An alternative is to reach out to leading simulation software companies and see if they have a simulation solution that meets most of your needs. One of the biggest advantages is that it saves you time, which can be an important factor if you are transitioning to a remote learning environment in a short period of time. These companies can also provide invaluable technical and content support. Okay, step five. Do computer simulations help students learn science? How can we tell? So the use of simulations in your course should be explicitly related to specific and measurable student learning outcomes with a clear plan for assessment and evaluation of their effectiveness. So consider the following. What questions can be answered by the simulation? What conclusions can be made from the data collected? What is the evidence that students gained new knowledge or skills from the simulation? Have the simulations improved learning outcomes? Simulations are much more useful if they are designed to help you some of the questions above. Although many simulations leave assessment and evaluation of their effectiveness up to the educator, meaning you have to create them yourself, many simulations are designed with built-in assessments that help guide and assess student learning. They are definitely a big time saver. So to conclude and in summary, I just want to leave you with the idea that computer simulations are flexible instructional tools you can use to support student learning. They are not only suited for hybrid and remote teaching situations where in-person activities may not be possible, but are also effective as part of any science instruction in promoting content knowledge, science process skills, and conceptual change. All right. So I'd now like to take a few minutes to show you Starry Night College textbook. And Starry Night includes and expands on the OpenStax astronomy textbook and seamlessly integrates a browser-based planetarium, engaging simulations, interactive exercises, and assessments. It also works with your school's learning management system, which ensures continuity of access, assigning, and grading. So let me just switch my views. There you go. So after you sign in, you see four tabs at the top, table of contents, exercises, assignments, and simulator. Table of contents is selected by default. And here you have full access to a complete web browser version of the OpenStax astronomy textbook. This particular textbook contains 30 chapters. If you are already using this textbook, you'll feel right at home. Now, we implemented a number of strategies to enhance the textbook with simulations. So let me show you some of them. So I'm going to select one of the chapter sections called Ancient Astronomy. And in this section, the textbook is talking about ancient astronomy and primarily how our knowledge of the solar system has changed over time. As you browse, you can see the exact text, images, and links found in the OpenStax astronomy textbook. Now, the first thing we did was enrich the two-dimensional textbook experience with interactive three-dimensional simulations. So in this case, instead of just looking at images, we added two simulations to show the differences between the Earth-centric system of planetary motion and the modern Sun-centric system. And students are able to interact and explore these simulations. So for example, you can rotate the view, you can zoom in or out, you can even right-click and learn more about any object. So there are actually over 200 of these simulations sprinkled throughout the textbook. So for example, when the textbook talks about the great red spot on Jupiter, students can see a 3D model of Jupiter and rotate the planet. When the textbook mentions retrograde motion, there is a simulation showing the apparent backward motion of Mars in the sky. These simulations really help to bring the subject matter in the textbook to life. Okay, let's go back to the table of contents. Now you can see that some items in the table of contents have a blue assign button. These are exercises, labs, and reading quizzes we've added to the textbook. Each is correlated to the learning objectives of a chapter section and slotted in the appropriate location in the textbook for easy reference. If you click on the assign button, a window pops up 
that allows you to assign the activity to a class that you have set up in your learning management system. Now, all of the uh, assignments and activities are listed in the assignments tab. And students don't see any assignments until you assign them. If you click on the exercises tab, it gives you a list of all of the activities you can assign to a class. And there's a fair amount of content available. Now let's look at one of the simulation-based exercises in more detail. And in this case, it's an exercise in chapter four on the year and seasons. So on the left, we have the instructions and questions for the exercises. And on the right, we have a fully featured web-based planetarium. And students read the text and use the planetarium simulator to answer the questions. When they are done, they can submit their assignment and the grade is sent to your learning management system. Now, I mentioned in one of my slides that simulations are very effective at dispelling science misconceptions. And the first part of this lesson addresses a big one when it comes to the cause of the seasons. And that is the misconception that summer is the result of the earth being closer to the sun and winter is the result of the earth being further away from the sun. Of course, we know that this is not true. For example, it wouldn't explain why the seasons are reversed in the northern and southern hemispheres. Our summer is their winter. In the planetarium simulator, students can visually observe that the earth is about the same distance from the sun all year long. To confirm this, we ask students to take accurate measurements of the Earth's sun distance in June and December. So here we can see in the toolbar that the date is set to June 21st, which is summer in the Northern Hemisphere. We then activate the measure tool and we measure the distance between the Earth and the sun. And here we can see that the distance is 1.02 AU, and AU is short for astronomical unit, which is about 93 million miles. We then ask students to play time forward and stop six months later in December. So now it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere. And here we can see that the Earth's sun distance is now 0 0.983 AU. So the Earth is actually closest to the sun at the beginning of January, which is winter in the Northern Hemisphere. And this is a great example of students using real data to dispel a common misconception. So what causes the seasons on Earth? Let's take a closer look. So in this section, we look at um, the Earth's rotational axis from space. And this is a perspective that's not otherwise possible for students. And here you can see that we've magnified the Earth. The sticks at the top and bottom are the poles. As we play time forward, we ask students to pay close attention to the tilt of the Earth as the Earth goes around the sun. By looking at the time display in the toolbar, Students can see that the North Pole is tilted towards the sun in June, which is summer in the Northern Hemisphere, and away from the sun in December, which is winter in the Northern Hemisphere. Note that the Earth's tilt remains pointed in the same direction in space, which happens to be near Polaris, the North Star. But the orientation of Earth's tilt with respect to the sun does change as we orbit the sun. So what does this change in orientation with respect to the sun mean for the seasons on Earth? So in the next section, we take students back to Earth, which is a perspective that they're familiar with. And we ask them to make a series of Earth-based observations of the sun in summer and winter. So here we have our date set to June 21st, which is summer in the Northern Hemisphere. And we ask students to play time and we ask them to record how many hours of daylight there are and how high the sun gets in the sky. We then ask them to make the same measurement six months later. So here we are now in December 21st, which is winter in the Northern Hemisphere. And we ask them to play time forward and to record how many hours of daylight there are and how high the sun gets in the sky. So here students can now begin to connect the changing altitude of the sun in the sky during the year with the orientation of the tilt of the Earth's axis with respect to the sun. So through a series of observations, data collection, and measurements, students will come to the understanding that the tilt of the Earth's axis causes the seasons. Specifically, the amount of sunlight hitting the ground is greater when the sun is higher in the sky. The sunlight is more concentrated. This concentrated sunlight warms the Earth's surface more efficiently 
than the less concentrated sunlight striking Earth from the lower altitude sun during winter. The higher sun of summer also means more hours of sunlight, further increasing the heating of Earth's surface. Now, we also like to allow students to apply their new knowledge to new situations. So in this case, we loaded a simulation of Mars and we ask students, does Mars have seasons like Earth? So here students can see that Mars axis has a similar tilt to the Earth's axis. Mars has seasons as well. If you observe carefully, you can see that because Mars completes an orbit of the sun in two years, the seasons are twice as long. Okay, so I went through this exercise very, very quickly, but that was just a brief overview of one of our many simulation-based exercises. The last thing I wanna show you is the simulator tab. And the simulator tab gives you access to the planetarium program outside the context of the exercises. So this is a great instructor tool for classroom demonstration or for students who want to explore on their own. And the simulator is very easy to use. There are very few controls that they have to learn. So for example, if you want to move the sky around, you can just drag it. If you want to learn more about an object, you simply just click on it and you can right click on it and select show info. And here we have an information panel about that object. And here you can see all of the real data on the sun. You can even display more data. And this is real data that students will often use to answer questions in the exercises. We also have Wikipedia-like description for each object along with images. Okay. Now the planetarium simulator allows you to observe from anywhere on Earth, or from any planet, moon, asteroid, star. You can even leave the Milky Way galaxy behind. And you can also travel backwards and forwards in time 100,000 years. So let's say we wanna go to one of the planets. Let's go to Jupiter, it's my favorite. And it gives you the option to fly there. So I'm just gonna click on that. We actually fly to Jupiter. Okay, oh, we flew a little bit too close. We crashed into Jupiter. So here we have, um, Jupiter, and you can start seeing some of its moons. Let me just uh, zoom back out. So here's Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system, and its four largest moons known as the Galilean moons. Now we know that Jupiter has many more moons, and we can display those as well. So I'm going to op open up the options, and the options allows you to control everything that shows up in the sky chart. So for example, you can change your horizon. You can turn on constellation illustrations. You can turn on different guides. So all of the options are available to you. Now we want to turn on the minor moons. So I'm going to go to solar system, planets and moons, and I'm going to select minor moons. There you go. And so now here we see all of Jupiter's moons. It kind of looks like a, a bird's nest. All right, so I'm going to go back home. And we also have many education specific tools built into the program. So I showed you the um, measurement tool, but we also have um, another tool called an HR diagram. So I'm gonna bring that up. And an HR diagram tells us something about the life cycle of a star. And this is a dynamic HR diagram. So as I move the sky around, it plots the stars that are in view. Now, if I, click on one of the stars in the sky chart, it actually plots that star in the HR diagram. And conversely, if I click on one of the stars in the HR diagram, it will also highlight what that star is in the sky chart. So it's a very useful uh, kind of tool. Now, the other cool thing that you can do is you can create and save your own simulations, either to your local drive or Google Drive. So this can also be a great creation tool for you to create your own simulations and even your own lessons. You can even ask students to create their own uh, views and share them with you. Now, I've actually created a few, and you'll find them in the application favorites. There are over 500 uh, different simulations. And I just want to show you a couple. Um, this is a great way to explore um, what the program can actually do. So I'm going to go into Solar System, Comets and Asteroids, and Asteroid Belt. So here's a simulation of the Asteroid Belt that I did. I just turned on the planets and highlighted the asteroids. And if you want to animate this, you can just set the time step to days. And here you can see the asteroids going around the sun. Another interesting simulation is Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. This was a comet that broke apart into 21 fragments back in 1994, and then it slammed into um, Jupiter. 
So it's really kind of neat. Now, one of my favorite planets uh, is Mars, and Mars um, is getting brighter in the sky each day, so it's it's a good time to observe Mars. And so there's many different files here. You can look at retrograde motion of Mars and different features on the surface. But one of the interesting files is sort of a re reimagining of what Mars might look like if it had liquid water on its surface. We also have uh, other types of data. For example, we have um, different sky surveys, so you can see the sky in different wavelengths. So for example, here is the sky in hydrogen alpha. So you're basically inside of the celestial sphere. Or maybe you want to see the sky in infrared. Okay. So I could speak for hours uh, on Starry Night, so I think I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I'm happy to provide anyone with uh, an in-depth demonstration of Starry Night College textbook um, afterwards. And um, just reach out to me. I added my email in the, uh, in the opening slide. So this concludes my uh, formal presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, Courtney? Yes, thank you so much, Pedro. We actually have quite a few. So um, oh. <laughs> you guys do feel free to keep entering your questions. We'll get to as many as we can. If there are any we don't get to, then we can always follow up with you afterwards. Um, this one's a pretty, pretty brief though. Uh, how different are Starry Night versions seven and eight? Harold wants to know. Yeah, so version seven was released a, a number of years ago. Um, I imagine probably at least six years ago. So it's a little bit older. Um, so version eight ensures that um, Starry Night will work with the latest operating systems. But we've also added a lot of additional features, including like the all-sky survey um, images that I showed, um, exoplanets, um, uses all of the latest algorithms and surface image for, for planets. Um, so it contains a lot of the same features that you're used to in version seven. So it's an easier, easy transition to version eight. It just has the latest and greatest, and it ensures that it works with all of the latest operating systems. We, and we do have a comparison chart, by the way. If you go to starrynight.com, there's a very detailed comparison chart between version 7 and, and, um, and version 8. Okay, another question we have is, um, can, this, can Starry Night be integrated with one's LMS? And if so, which LMSs do you integrate with? I've had specific questions yes. about D2L, Moodle, and Canvas, but I imagine that there's the gamut of questions relating to that. Yeah, and that's one of the things we're really excited with Starry Night College Textbook, is that we do offer a learning management system integration, and we integrate basically with everyone. We have instructors using Blackboard, Canvas, Desire to Learn, slash um, Brightspace, um, did I mention Blackboard? We have Google um, as well. Uh, we have Microsoft. So, um, and any any sort of LMS um, we can usually integrate with hasn't been uh, hasn't been an issue. Um, what we do is uh, we set up an appointment with your um, LMS administrator, and then we have we designed a, a web console, and uh, we guide your LMS administrator through it. And then once you're integrated, it allows uh, your students to log in using their email and passwords that they have for their school. And then it also allows you to assign uh, activities and also to get a grade back into your LMS gradebook. Great, okay. Another question is, how do I get an account? Do I need to pay anything before students start enrolling for the course next semester? Um, and a similar question was, is it possible to get experience, to get access um, for a trial period before making a decision to add it as the resource for your course? Yeah, so um, yes, you can absolutely get a trial. You can, you can reach out to me and I'll provide you with a trial. Um, Starry Night College textbook uh, is free for uh, instructors to use. Um, so students do pay for access or you purchase access for students but uh, instructors do not pay for access to to the product um, we offer that um, for free and of course you know the open open sax astronomy is freely available so we you know we don't charge for that we just incorporate all of these great simulations uh, and activities right into the uh, open sax astronomy textbook so in, for instructors it's it's free and you're absolutely welcome to to try it great um, and if they do decide to sign up what how do you do that so if you go to learn.simcur.com, uh, that's learn.simcur.com, um, there's an about section. There's actually a form there. 
and you can fill it out and I'll get that that email and then we can set up um, a meeting uh, with you to provide you an overview and then if it's something that you like we'll give you a trial and if you like the trial we'll then get in touch with your um, LMS administrator and we'll do the integration so that your students can log in. Um, or you can just go to Starry Night, any, any of, our, of our properties, you can go to simulationcurriculum.com or starrynight.com and just send us an email and it will get to the right place. Great. Um, another question is the planetarium simulation, planetarium simulation has a lot of buttons and sliders that a student has to learn to manipulate. Are there training videos or would we need to create those on our own? For students? So you might be, yeah, so you might be speaking about maybe our desktop version. So we've now we've we've moved, we still have desktop versions, but we've moved to the web and we've really simplified the UI. There's actually very few buttons now that you need to learn how to use. And that was one of the design considerations. Um, so it should be fairly straightforward. But yes, we do have a tutorial built into Starry Night College textbook that gives you an overview of all of the basic tools that you need to know in order to complete every single exercise. And it takes about 20 minutes to run through the tutorial and then you know you can be off on your own. So most students are up and running you know, in a matter of about 10 minutes. But if you do require um, additional help, I'm available. Um, and you know, we've even done presentations to a group of uh, instructors or even to like a class just to kind of get them going. So um, you know, we, we're very kind of open to offering as much help as, as, as we can. Great. The next question is, how much does this cost for the student? And right. is there an option to, for them to keep access um, beyond the end of their class for an additional fee? Yes, so um, the regular cost is $29.95, uh, so $29.95 for uh, each student. And that gives them access to the product for one year. So it's not just for one semester, they have access for a full year. Now, if they are interested in buying, like let's say, you know, a, a desktop version of Starry Night later on, um, we know that they're a previous customer, so we usually give them like an upgrade discount um, as well. But the nice thing is that, um, you know, they continue to have access to the platform for a year. So um, even after their class uh, is done, they can still use it for a while. Yeah. Great. Um, can you speak to the accessibility of the product? Um, is the interface screen reader compatible? Is it considered accessible to students with visual disabilities through alt text or other descriptions? So we, we are using, everything is, is coded like an HTML. So um, I do have um, students using it to read the text off of the, of the screen. So any, um, any tool that your web browser comes with should be usable um, in the platform. So most browsers definitely have text to speech, so you can use that. You can also use um, the uh, zoom in and zoom out text function. And that not only, not only does it zoom in the text, uh, it also zoom in all of the buttons and controls. Um, so we try to make it as sort of accessible in that way as, as, as possible. So um, I'm happy to kind of, you know, I'm not sure who asked the question, but kind of give them a demonstration and see if the tools that are built into the browser are sufficient for their needs. And I'll make sure to pass all the questions to you afterwards, Pedro, so sure. you can follow up if needed. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, great. Let's see. Is there a Stellar Parallax simulator? Uh, we do have an activity on Stellar Parallax using uh, real stars. So um, it's a very minute, It's I think it's one arc second that we're measuring. Um, but we then give uh, students the formula to plug in and they get to calculate uh, Stellar Parallax to, uh, I believe, um, Alpha Centauri which is about 4.31, I think, light years. Be very precise because otherwise instructors will get uh, give me trouble for it. I think that's yeah. the latest value. I just had a question on that recently, so yeah. Okay, good timing. Um, this is a kind of broader question, but we had a question come in uh, asking, how effective will our simulations like this when dealing with large classes such as 200 students? I think it's ideal for that type of situation. Um, all of our simulations are student-centered, so they are designed for each student to use on their own. Um, an instructor can use them to demonstrate something, but they are designed for, for students to kind of do it on their own. So it doesn't matter if you have you know, 200. Some, some of our classes are 200. Other ones are over 1,000 students. So um, 
they all interact one on one with the simulation. Great. Um, is there flexibility to edit or delete components within the simulations, I guess, or within the activities? Yeah, not at this time. It is a question that we receive often, especially with Starry Night College textbook. We are looking at ways that, for example, we have reading quizzes in there. And so you might not want to assign every single um, question in the reading quiz. So we're looking at ways to um, allow instructors to select which questions to ask. Um, but currently, no, but the platform is evolving. This is our next generation platform. So we're putting a lot of our effort uh, into it. And uh, the first product that we've released was on astronomy. But of course, we also do um, earth science software as well. And we're even um, starting to do um, anatomy product as well using the OpenStax textbook. Awesome. Um, another question is, is there a question bank that we can use for creating lab questions? So we do not have a question bank. Um, we do have um, reading quizzes for each chapter section. Um, and those are over a thousand questions but we don't have a separate test bank. Uh, again, it is something that we, we wanna work on and, and provide. And we wanna make the assessment, instead of just multiple choice questions, we wanna the assessment to be simulation based. So that's something that we're looking very seriously at. Um, so we think that simulations, I mean, not only to impart knowledge and, you know, and skills, but also I think they would be a very effective assessment tool as well. So. Um, if we do create an assessment bank, we want it to be a little bit more interactive. Although I, I should say, maybe I shouldn't plug, but there are other OpenStax partners that do, uh, you know, tie in with OpenStax Astronomy, and they do offer assessment banks as well. So that might be an alternative uh, until we develop our own. <laughs> um, but there are other partners that do offer other material for OpenStax, and, that, and that's actually one of the big benefits of going with OpenStax is that it's not just us. There are other partners available, and they might fill in a particular gap for you. Thanks, Pedro. Um, and then I'm, this, I'm going to wrap it up with this last question. Um, someone has asked, do you have existing professors that someone could talk to about their experience if they're interested in trying Starry Night? Absolutely, I do. So please do get in touch with me. Uh, we do have you know, we've been around for a very long time. So we have many professors that have used the product for a long time. And we also have a lot of professors using Starry Night College textbook right now. Um, I even had one that sent me um, a survey that students did at the end of the course. And it was just incredible to read the feedback and how much they enjoyed using Starry Night and, and the product. So I'm definitely welcome to, you know, to, sh to share that with you. Um, so definitely get in touch and I can, I can provide uh, some contacts. Great, thank you. Um, guys, I know there are just a few questions we didn't get to. I tried to get to as many as possible, but we um, we can follow up after the webinar. I'll, I'll make sure that we have we both have all of our questions between the two of us to answer asynchronously. Um, Pedro, is there any any parting parting wisdom you want to share or just a, a goodbye um, for the audience? Yeah, I know this is a challenging time for everyone. Um, over the past two months, I've, I've spoken with literally dozens of instructors. Um, I've been telling everyone, just, just be kind to yourself. There's no, no right or wrong. We're all kind of learning as, as, as we go. Um, and we're here to help. Um, if you do have any questions, um, especially on, on, you know, if, if you are teaching astronomy or if you are teaching geology or meteorology, um, we're definitely more than happy to, to help you transition into an online only environment. Obviously, we have a lot of experience in that. And even if you just want to chat, um, we're definitely open to that because by chatting with you, we also we also learn. And um, that's a lot of knowledge that we then put into our products. So um, definitely get in touch. But uh, yeah, you, you're going to do great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hedger. I, I just want to echo um, that sentiment and, uh, and reiterate we, at OpenStax, we also we still want to be there for you and provide as many resources as we can to make the transition easier for you. Um, so please do tune in to future webinars that look like they might be of interest. Um, stay tuned for more free resources that we're putting out. Uh, 
to help with your online courses. If you have any feedback on anything that would be helpful that we have not yet developed, please let us know. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share both mine and Pedro's email addresses in the chat window. Pedro, should I just go ahead and share your your main email address? Was that uh, absolutely? Or is there a different one that's yeah. better? Okay. No, no problem. Yeah. Okay. I, don't feel, I just shared I don't that in the chat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and with that, I just want to say thanks for joining us and have a wonderful long weekend. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.